I'm not going to introduce myself. Um, this talk is looking at testing trends, the past, the present, and the future. Um, this is my Twitter handle in the middle of the screen that you can see there. I'm also on LinkedIn if you want to get in touch with me, and that's about as much as an intro you're going to get. Um, so this is me pulling on my experiences from 22 years in testing. So that's why the timeline that you see starts in 1998. And one, what I really want to get across here is that as testers, it's really important that we continue to change because everything else is changing around us. And if we don't, we'll be left behind. And if we get left behind, God knows what will happen to testers stroke testing. So on this journey, I'm going to point out some stuff that's going to make you feel really uncomfortable, I hope. But I'm doing it for a reason. I'm doing it because I care. And I'm doing it because hopefully after this, you'll be able to pull something out that allows you to go forward and think about your role as a tester in the future. Let's get into it. OK, so in 1998, I started testing and it was Y2K that sucked me in. Like many people that entered testing in those sort of years, it was the Y2K bug that created a, an almost testing phenomenon. Um, but what was actually the tech stacks and the tools used in those that, that time? So in 1998, it was pretty much a three-tier architecture. And if you didn't have that on your CV, you simply didn't get a job. So every time I moved roles after the first role I was in, I made sure that was one of the key things I always put on my CV. And if you look to the right there, you can see mainframes. They were actually coming to their end of their lifetime. Some of them are still around. But basically, everybody was thinking, how do we get off mainframes? And that was the trend then. And if I look at what tools I was using, I was knees deep in PLSQL command line. I was absolutely knees deep in Unix scripts. Uh, and that was command line as well. And the way of working in those days was everything was scripted test cases. There was no such thing as thinking outside the box and doing exploratory testing. Well, there wasn't in my career in the early years anyway. And don't forget, I'm pulling on my experiences here. Everything was scripted. Everything was structured. And the reason for that was the ways of working. And this isn't going to come out to a shock to many of you. Um, it was pretty much waterfall, V model. There was silos after silos. And before I go to those bullet points on the right, I really want to explain what happened to me in my first four years in testing. I um, realized entering testing in 1998, I needed to upskill very, very quickly. And the strategy I had was I changed jobs every 12 months. So in the first four years, I had four jobs, all in different industries, but testing. And the reason I did that was to upskill. Now, what you're, those words you see on the right are sort of things that I picked up. So in my first role, I never met a developer. They were in a different building under lock and key. You had to have a secret pass to get into them. We were in a separate building half a mile down the bloody road. Um, in my third role, which was two years into my testing career, I started a new role and there was 100 devs, four testers, and I decided to go and talk to some developers that started on the same day as me. They're on my induction. And by the time I got back to my desk, there was an email waiting for my team leader and basically, it said, tell Lee to stop talking to our developers. You know the rules. Testers don't talk to devs. And, and that was really tough to take. Um, I didn't really understand why this, this had come about. But those same developers, guess what? They had KPIs, KPIs that drove their bonuses. And the KPI that drove their bonuses more than any other KPI was the least amount of defects found in the code that they wrote. So I started working with those couple of developers that I knew. Uh, I started looking at their code before they checked it in. I started going through their code with them. We found defects. They fixed them. They checked the code in. It came to me to test with my testing hat on, and their defects were really low, and I took a slice of their bonus. There's a valuable lesson. Okay. Um, but overall, with this, this, this waterfall V model, which, let's face it, in 1998 still exists in some places, and it has been rife for the last 20, 20 odd years. I really feel that there's been a battle mentality, especially in the early years, 1998, that I refer to here, of a, an us and them. And I think test leadership are to partly blame for this, of which I've been part of the problem. Um, I really feel that the battle was um, devs didn't relay what code was coming. Testers would write a, a rake of test cases, and as soon as a release was released, we'd dive in and flood the defect database to show that that was our value and that was our worth. And it was completely wrong. I didn't like that mentality. Uh, I think at times I bred that mentality in teams, but when I started seeing co-location, uh, cross-functional teams, I started realizing that was the way forward, and this way of working was actually wrong. 
And what else did we see in 1998? Well, in waterfall, even when you peered into test departments, you saw a mini waterfall, even within the test departments. So even in the test department came to us, you saw a test architect, a system integration tester, or a system tester, automation tester, UAT, NFT. I could go on and on and on. But that in its own right was a mini waterfall. And that felt wrong to me. And that still, that trend was still evidence up to probably five years ago. And it's still evidence in some, some big companies. What else in 1998? Well, what kind of testers was I working with when I started? 1998 was probably the first time I saw a computer. And I was surrounded by some really smart people. Now, those smart people were people that were gaming in the late 70s, early 80s, usually from a rich middle class background. And I make no excuses for saying that on here. And that's what's bred the problem we have right now, right today. The DNA of tech goes right back to those late 70s, early 80s. The gamers then grew up to be testers and tech people in the late 90s, early 20s. And that's the problem we're facing in today. And, and, and we know that now. And I'm glad to see that the tech community is making waves in trying to fix this. But this is what I was surrounded with in 1998 when I started testing. I also saw this as a huge trend, and this cost me my job many times outsourcing or offshoring. Luckily, sometimes I spotted it before it actually impacted me. But I would say in the late 90s and all through the 2000s, this was a massive trend. It's done a U-turn now, and I'm going to come back to that later on in the presentation. And I just want to quickly relay how testers found jobs in 1998. So there was a newspaper that morphed into a magazine around about 1995 called Computer Weekly. It's a great website now to this day. But back in 1998, there was no website for jobs. Uh, you had to go and buy this magazine, look at all the national jobs, see which ones were local to you. So if it wasn't for word of mouth or this newspaper, it was very hard to sort of know what jobs were out there for testers. However, there was the beginning of a new trend. 1998 saw the emergence of recruitment agencies in tech. And without them, actually, I wouldn't have got the jobs that I've got today. Um, so I'm very grateful to the recruitment agencies. And that's a trend that started round about 98, that I say there, and has continued to this day. So if we go back to the timeline, I want to focus on 1999 because I want to do a slight contradiction. I'm now into my second testing role. And I saw something that broke the norm. I went into a cross-functional team and I bloody loved it. I had the developer either side of me. I had BAs, project managers, architects. We all sat around a table of eight and we worked collaboratively to create software that, that was of value. There was no agile then, by the way. It was just a cross-functional team. And this broke the norm. After this role, I went back into waterfall world for many, many years. But this gave me a glimmer of hope. This gave me an insight that there are different ways to working, even back in the day there. And the other trend that started round about now, I used Windrunner, which is uh, one of the first automation tools back in 1999. And I have to admit, I struggled with it. And I'll tell you why. I spent so much time refactoring my tests after each release because it was click and record. I, I couldn't really work out the value. By the time I'd refactored all my click and uh, record tests, a brand new release would drop again. And I was on this hamster's wheel of just constantly just refactoring tests. So I found it quite hard to see the value. But eventually through time, I did see the value of automation. I still do to this day. So if I jump to 2001, I've, I want to put up a big alert here. Woo, 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 tech and test disruptor alert. It was the birth of Agile. Um, now, for the next sort of, I would say, seven years, not much really happened. I usually find with any kind of disruptor, whether that be a bit of tech or whether it be a new way of working, it usually takes 10 years for it to sort of bed in and become the new norm. So if we think if we move 10 years on from 2001 to 2011, I think it's safe to say the world had, had grasped Agile as a thing and started to use it. But it did take that 10 years of bedding in. But this is when it was born, 2001. So now I really want to have a look at 2002 because there were some major things that backed up the trends. So IBM released the Rational Functional Tester Automation Tool. Again, this backed up in my stomach, my gut feeling that actually, yes, automation is here to stay because once the big players get involved, they realize it's a cash cow. They realize there's money to be made here. And that's when I thought this is going to be massive in 2002. And also in 2002, I'm going to say something really odd here. MMS was a massive tech disruptor. <laughs> You're probably laughing when I say photo messaging 2002. 
But I was lucky enough to work on the world's first uh, embedded MMS client that sat on every phone that sent, was able to work and send a message from every phone across every network, across every country, uh, and land on a phone the other side. And what that meant for the first time is operators could make money. Now, putting the money to one side, the actual concept of sending a photo from one phone to another, the concept of sending a video from one phone to another, think about how we, we live our lives today. We're constantly sending pictures, there's Snapchat, there's Instagram, videos, TikTok, all these platforms we take for granted now. This is where it was born in 2002. So now I want to move to a key testing disruptor in 2003 that, again, I was lucky enough to work on firsthand. And it was the world's first touchscreen smartphone. It was at Sony Ericsson. It was called the Sony Ericsson P800. I have one here. It still works. I forgot to hand it back when I left. It's stolen goods. I don't care. This was a huge disruptor for testing, and I'm going to show you why. All of a sudden, we went from testing a closed system. If you think about you know, uh, testing a, a closed system, there's nothing interrupting from the outside. With the mobile phone, we had to completely change our minds regarding how we tested. We had to understand the operating system. We had to understand that there was interruptions and interactions with other things outside of the app that we were testing. And I'll bring that to life. If I was testing the image gallery, I had to understand that if a phone call came through, that, that, that was the highest priority in the list of priority of stuff. If an MMS came through, that was second priority, and that would interrupt me watching or interacting with the image that I was testing. And understanding all these different interactions and interruptions was, was really key. And no longer was it just a button on a screen. If you think about a screen on a desktop, you click outside of the buttons, nothing happens. A touch screen, you touch anywhere, something happens. As, as I've already said, the operating system was absolutely key to understand. And, and it was the first time I think testers started to look at full stack. We started to look at the chips on, on the hardware. We started to look at the operating system and how that impacted the, the app layer, the system layer that sat above it. Interoperability became really important. How does all this tech talk to each other? How does a handset from Sony Ericsson talk to a handset that is Nokia? And it's the first time, really, the next three I came across, usability, performance, and security. I had to really start thinking about those. And don't forget, this is 2003. We're not talking like five years ago. I'm talking like 17 years ago. We were having to think about these things. DRM stands for digital rights management. It's, what, it's the wrapper that goes around content to make sure that you pay for it. And that, that encryption and decryption was the first time testers were having to start to think about that. And, of course, the network implications testing prototypes, voice activation. I could go on and on and on about the richness of that first touchscreen smartphone that I feel bred a whole new wave of testers. T testing those touchscreens from 2003 through to 2009, I came out with so much in my head, and I know every other tester that worked at those companies did as well, and I think there's a, a few on the line today. I'd be interested to hear from them after the presentation. So that was 2003. I'm going to move along to 2006, and I'm going to say, as I've just shown you, the mobile phone touchscreen was one of the biggest disruptors for testers. Here's the other one, the birth of AWS. And look at the year. It's 2006. If we had 10 years onto that and jumped to 2016, there was a tipping point where everyone knew all their platforms needed to be in the cloud. And AWS, Azure, Azure was born in 2010. Lo and behold, there's that magical 10-year gap where it goes from birth to becoming mainstream. And I'm going to come back to the cloud and how it impacts testers later on in the talk. This is massive, a massive turning point for testers. And also in 2006, I felt that the testing community for the first time had something to explain away from uh, structured testing. And, and for the first time, using the words exploratory testing and session-based testing, I felt that people outside of testing as well started to see the value of not just following uh, scripts and letting testers use their knowledge to go away and in real time do some test design, test execution, do the analysis and learn to drive their next steps through the software. And, and, and this was the beginning of the trend, I feel. Now, exploratory testing was defined way, way before 2006. But again, I feel this was a tipping point, the start of a trend. And if we think about how, how we test today, if you've automated through the stack properly, exploratory testing is a real 
valued activity now, I feel. And this is almost the tipping point. This is where I feel the trend started, 2006. Moving on to 2008, there's two things here I want to point out. The App Store became one of the disruptors in its time. So we went, and if you want proof of that, read the stories of Google, the Google board, when they went into work on the Monday for their, their weekly kickoff session, all the leaders of Google were in a room, and they noticed that all their hits on their browser had dipped almost by 50%. And someone on the board pulled out an Apple phone and said, it's because of this. And they looked at the App Store, and that changed the world. It changed the world on many fronts. How we test apps changed. All the apps were always pre-installed on the phones. All of a sudden, there was a marketplace where you could download. So we have to test that it's safe before it comes downloaded. Uh, and the whole world around testing apps changed. But it did something else. It created the new wave of techies. All of a sudden, a new wave of techies creating apps in their bedrooms was born. And those people are now the people that are leading the tech world. Those people that were designing apps 2008 and onwards, and now your CTOs, your engineering leads, they're now shaping the world of tech. It was a pivotal moment for tech. Also in 2008, from a testing perspective, it was the first time I'd seen um, web tester be the majority of test roles. It really was. If you went onto any job board, um, you would see probably 50% or more as, as web tester. And I think now, looking at the rise of automation, 2008 really started to gather momentum, key momentum. Um, and then bottom left, I've got the how you find jobs in 2008. So we saw the birth of the job websites for the first time. So Monster, we saw that still the foundations was the recruitment cr recruitment agencies. But here's a key thing. There's another image there, ISTQB. In 2008 and 2009, we went into a deep recession. And what the recruitment agencies did, which I think was naughty, was they started to insist that everybody had ISTQB. Or every single job advert that came out said, must be ISTQB qualified. Now, you're telling me someone with 15, 10 years of testing that doesn't have an ISTQB is no longer relevant. And someone that comes out and does testing for 12 months that has the certification uh, is going to get employed over someone that's really experienced. It's a tough discussion, and I'm interested in people's thoughts afterwards. I think there's value in ISTQB for people wanting to get into testing and people new to testing. I'm not sure there's value um, for people that are that have got the battle scars of actually testing in the wild. Um, but this is a trend I saw, and it lasted for some time. It lasted for probably five, six years. Every bloody job title or job description had that in it, and it, it really annoyed me. As you can probably tell, I'm getting animated. Just need to take a deep breath. Uh, and on the right there, you can see Agile Manifesto. The reason I've put that in there in 2008 is that was my first experience of using Agile in anger. Uh, Sony Ericsson, we, we scaled down in size before we shut the sites, and we started to experiment with Agile. And I have to say, it reminded me of that job in 1999 where we had the cross-functional team. And I really enjoyed um, the experiments that we did with, uh, with trying to find out what Agile was and how to use it. We had a few failures in that time, but that's that's what Agile is about. Um, and I sort of got a gut feeling this, this could really take off. There's something in this. I hope it does take off and we get out of this waterfall world. So moving on, the next slide is going to make you all feel very, very uncomfortable. And I make no apologies about that. I'm going to jump to 2011. This was a talk given by Alberto at the Google um, Tech Conference in 2011. And it changed the world of testing, I feel. Oh, two weeks later, James Whitaker stood on a stage in Manchester at uh, UK Star. And I was in the crowd to receive his version of this talk. Same title. Now, for people that weren't, the reason this had such an impact on testing, and probably the reason a lot of you are facing into does testing add value, could be tied back to this talk. What happened with this talk was those that weren't in the room saw the title, so CTOs, engineering leads, etc., and took the title as labatum. They said, right, testing's dead. And that led to a lot of people losing their job in the test industry. I know that because I know some people that did lose their job based off the title of this talk. I was lucky enough to be in the room when James Whitaker gave this talk, and it was a provocative title, which is typical James Whitaker. 
But actually, when you listened to the message, it was the following. If you don't continue to self-develop, if you don't continue to add value as a tester, you may find yourself out of a role. Testers and testing has to constantly evolve to keep adding value with the new wave of tech. Now, this was nine years ago. I think that message stands true to this day. I really do. It's just the title was so provocative. Those that weren't in the room took it as, as is, uh, and it caused a lot of damage. And uh, if you ask some people, they're really bitter about this. I'm, I'm not because I was in the room and I understood it. So now we've looked at 2011. I want to start looking at 2012, where I started seeing Agile really starting to influence the testing minds, the test leadership, how people went about thinking about testing. And uh, I'm glad Martin Lowe is, is on the call because he's going to love this picture. Um, this is the Agile testing quadrants. And this was created by Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory. It's old. It's probably, I'm going to say, 12, 13 years old. But in 2012, I really started to see people use this as a visualization as to how they should ask questions about uh, to the Agile team about how we're going to test a feature, how we're going to test a, an epic, a charter, blah, blah, blah. So this, this was the first time I'd seen a visual of the conversations testers should have uh, in an Agile team. And I think it's still useful to this day. I really do. The other things I started seeing around about 2012 were the following. For those of you that have never worked in Waterfall and you've been lucky enough to go straight into testing and work purely in Agile, you won't have gone through this. But for the rest of us, there was a real tricky journey to be had. So when you break up a, a Waterfall test department and start dropping testers into Agile teams, um, all of a sudden the expectations that I saw, and I still see them to some extent, is that the Agile team think the tester is now going to do the test architect, the tester, the test manager, the test environment manager, and all the other sort of other roles that a test department has. That tester knows how to do all that. Well, lo and behold, guess what? They don't because there was very little coaching that went on. Usually you went home on a Friday from a waterfall team, came in on a Monday, and a job was done to you, and you weren't given much coaching on how to do these roles here. And added to that, I really do feel that a lot of the agile teams the moment you put a tester in there, because the title tester is in the job title, all of a sudden, everybody in the team thinks, well, you can add value to the unit test. That's true. Um, but you should know how to do all the functional CIT, AB, automation, security, performance, usability. I could go on and on and on. Those expectations aren't fair. Because, again, when you're in a waterfall team, you tend to be quite siloed. So you're either an automation tester or a performance tester or a, a functional manual sit tester. You, you very rarely get a tester that can do all that. And even to this day, I still think it's quite hard to get a tester that can do all that. So in the early days, 2012, I saw a lot of these awkward situations that testers went into agile teams. And, it, and it, testers took a battering, in my honest opinion. I really genuinely feel that. And in 2012, I saw this offshoring, outsourcing trend change because what I saw the tech leaders realize was the having offshore teams doesn't really fit into the agile model. Now, that's controversial in itself. I, I think it actually can. But I think a lot of uh, tech leaders went, no, we want people co-located um, because that's where the rich conversations take place. Uh, the team feel more together. Be interesting how COVID impacts that. It really will, whether we see another trend where they go, yeah, we can actually go offshore because everyone's working from home and everyone's on a screen. I just don't know. But all I know is around about 2012, I started seeing this, not anti-outsourcing or offshoring, but just a, a slight tweak where people said, we're going to bring everybody back together to be a co-located in the office. So moving back to the timeline, let's have a look at 2015. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is where the test community started waking up. And I think the test community started realizing that, wow, there's a lot going on. And wow, I may not have the skills for the future. So I can either take the blue pill and become status quo and not really change, or I can take the red pill and take control of my self-development and try and make myself relevant for the future. And that slide is from a talk that I've given uh, many times around the country in conferences. But, but why? Why self-development? Well, Everything that I've mentioned that wasn't already a trend was now becoming a trend. So cloud, which we're going to come to in the next slide, um, IoT, big data, 
Um, everything was changing. Agile was here to stay. Automation was here to stay. Software was now very, very complex compared to when I joined testing. Open source tools, wow. You know, the, the market's flooded with open source tools. Back in the day when I joined, there was only a handset of tools. Now there's a plethora. Um, cloud now, at this point, I think testers realized and the tech community that cloud was going to become the enabler, the enabler for big data, the enabler for IoT, the enabler for all the cool stuff people wanted to do. Uh, and, you know, and these things are here to stay. And that's why I think now in 2015, testers realized we need to go on the front foot because guess what? You own your own self-development. Your company doesn't, you do. And I think that was the pivotal moment in the tech community that people realized that. Now, this slide is going to make you feel uncomfortable, I think. I don't agree with this slide whatsoever, but I thought I'd put it in uh, to, to drive the discussion. So around about 2015, I saw a pivotal change in the market whereby I would say the majority of jobs were looking for automation testers. And this kind of statement was flippantly thrown around, especially by engineering leads, that uh, manual testing was dead. I'm going to come back to why it's not. But I think this was categorically wrong. I think there is value in automation through the stack at the unit, right level of unit automation, right level of service stroke API level automation, right level of UI automation, and then your, your exploratory testing that finds the unknowns at the top. So I think people that went around saying this were quite blasé and were usually either automation testers or engineers. Okay, so going back to the timeline, let's look at the current day. So 2020, let's see where we are right now as a test community. So I feel testing is alive, which contradicts part of the previous slide. Um, I think it will stay that way, but we need to change. We really need to keep changing and evolving. We need to be really resilient for the future because I think the future is going to be tough for us. I think we need to be adaptable, agile in mindset. Uh, we need to get more technical, by the way, uh, and that's a challenge for me because I wouldn't class myself as technical, but I've started on that journey to try and get more technical. I've done my Python courses and I'm now in the AWS practitioner course as well. So I, I think we need to continue to, to change. And the reason for that is if we think about the quality of code that's now created by the agile teams, and I've put dev teams there, you can interchange that with agile teams. I actually think with all the tools that are in AWS and all the tools available to devs now, I think devs have stepped up to the plate. I think devs are taking more ownership of the code they create, which means all those easy bugs to find, that's a, that's a thing of the past. It's like Kaiser Soze, it's gone. Um, so we need to change our skills to make sure we add value in a different way. Incoming controversial slide. I think automating at UI has been the biggest tech swindle ever known to mankind. Why? Because it's been driven by tool vendors. It's been a money-making exercise that we've had a, a hood pulled over our head for the last 20 years. I think now we're in a place where we know this is a swindle. We know this whole testing at UI has been driven by the people that made the tools to make money. Um, I think we now realize in the early days return on investment was poor. We needed to go through that. But if you think about the, the us and them that I spoke about in, in Waterfall, the test departments were usually left by themselves to define what tools and how they were going to test. There was very little interaction with the dev people to say, what testing have you done? So, of course, if a test department's given its own budget, they're going to go and spend it in their own way. And they went and spent it on automation tools because the automation vendors were saying, hey, we can make you X percent more efficient if you automate everything. That's brilliant, but it was never integrated with the, the tech stack and what the strategy was at each level. I'm a great fan of automating at the UI, but I think you should only be automating your critical user paths and nothing more. Because if you've automated correctly through the stack, that's all you should be automating. So I get quite animated at this, and I hope that's quite controversial and drives a, a quite a, a deep discussion afterwards. Um, the other thing in 2020 is I think we've realized as a tech community now what pipelines of code look like. So POC, that's a brand new acronym for you. Uh, I've patented that. You use that. You owe me some money. Um, but if we look at continuous delivery and continuous deployments, I think a lot more testers in 2020 understand those two pipelines than, say, five years ago. Uh, and I think now testers now understand the difference. So if we look at the bottom right-hand corner, um, 
a lot more difference around agile development, CI, CD, CD, and DevOps, and where you can add value. I think we're now starting to realize that, yes, they're scary because a lot of those pipelines are automated, but we can still add value. We can still ask the questions. I also think in 2020, certifications um, are back on the radar as adding value, but not the test ones. They're still adding value for people wanting to get into test and new to testing. That's great. Leave them to it. If I were a tester now, I would be looking at platform certifications like Azure, AWS. That's where the value is, because if you as a tester understand the platform the tech's built on, you're then going to know better how to test it and have those richer conversations with um, everybody in the team, especially architects. Um, so I want to look at the future now. So the testing toolbox is something I think as a, as a community we need. It's a metaphor. And this guy's done a great blog called The Tester's Toolbox, an alternative guide. Go and have a read. I believe in the future we need to be able to have that toolbox where we pull out the right tool, the right trait, the right behavior at the right time. It's not all about having the right tool. It's not all about automation. I'm talking about being able to pull out whether you're doing pairing with devs or whether you're pairing with the business, whether you're actually doing some testing or whether you're creating some automation scripts, whether you're running some exploratory testing, whether you're running a bug bash for the team. These are all different things that I think the tester now needs in the toolbox. I don't recruit automation only testers. And when I was at Very for the last two years, I didn't recruit automation testers. I recruited testers that had that toolbox. Okay, so here's the biggie, the future. Look at all those words round the cloud there. Who has tested for cost efficiency in the last week here on the call? I'd love to know who has, because that's going to be massive, as is performance, as is security. In the cloud now, it's a different ball game altogether. And remember that slide I put for the P800 where I wrote the list of what felt different and I put performance, security, uh, you know, the operating system, all those key things. I said, this is what felt really different. This is today's version. This is different because you need to understand the platform and where testing happens and where you can add value. So bringing down uh, test environments that are no longer needed for that day is a question to ask when you bring a feature into your team. What environments do we need to spin up? Who's going to bring them down? Because that's money. And money now is the driver. When you're on a standalone box in a data center, um, that's a box you pay for with all the computing power. It doesn't matter what you do on the day. You're not increasing your costs. The moment you go to cloud, you do anything different, it could have a cost incurred to it. So you need to understand that pipeline through the cloud. What else is in the tester's toolbox? Okay, so big data. So I've been interviewing for jobs in the last four weeks, and I would say, uh, seven or eight of the 10 interviews I've had have, have had a, a big data element to them. Now, let's blow the myth of big data. It's database testing. It's just with a different platform and with different tools. But if you've done database testing before, then you're going to be all right in big data testing. But everybody now seems to have an element of this, this picture you see here that sits below the bonnet that takes what's happening at the UI and then gives the business the decisions to, to change. And it's this, this picture here that sits below. And understanding this and being able to add value in this is going to be key to testers in the future. And of course, the microservice and the micro front end world, the micro front end is a probably a new terminology. It's, chop, it's just chopping up the front end to be smaller. Um, if you're not in this world, go and explore them because microservices aren't going away, I don't think. I think they're here to stay. What else is in the testers toolbox for the future? We're back to the agile testing quadrants. So look at those lovely words on the right. I think a tester of the future has to have those. So I've looked at the technical stuff, you know, understanding the cloud, AWS, Azure, understanding microservices, pipelines. That's what I would call the technical stuff. Having those attributes on the right, I think is going to be absolutely key. And if you look at the quadrants one and four, even if you're not in the cloud, even if you're not in microservice world, the world you're in right now, look at those two quadrants because those are the two quadrants I think we add least value to at the moment. But using those things on the right, you can start asking devs about what their unit tests are. You can start asking questions around, um, you know, what? how do we know this is going to perform? How do we know it's going to be secure? Uh, you know, you, you can drive those conversations. You can be the coach. And I've put an interesting word there, the glue. In all these 22 years I've been testing, I've always seen the testers and tester 
as being the glue that holds the team together. What does that mean? The tester is usually the person that sees the end-to-end -end solution or the end-to-end -end feature or the feature in its entirety. They're the, usually the only one out of the whole team that sees it through its inception right through to doing the demo at the end of the sprint or delivering it to the customer. And I think we're really good at having those rich conversations around the agile teams because we see it unfold like nobody else. So continue to be the glue. And here's a little golden nugget. Well, actually, there's 10 golden nuggets there. So I'm giving you 10 golden nuggets. Here's something for the future to think about. Ethical bias testing. There's three tools there, Lime, AI360, and What If. So what is ethical bias testing? If you have any data scientists in your company, go and see them and ask them about this because their algorithm and the data, the test data they're using to test their algorithm could have biases in them. And these tools weed out those biases to make sure that you know the, the algorithm is acting correctly. It's, it drives conversation. You don't need to understand these tools. These are tools that data scientists should be using to test. But hey, just like we pair with devs for unit testing, why shouldn't we be pairing with data scientists? Okay. And un unfortunately, another uncomfortable slide to put up. I actually think this, the, the, side or the, the demand for testers in the future will be less. And I'm basing this off experience. So when I went into very, the very group in 2015, we had 100 testers. When I left, we had 40. And I'm seeing this demand and everything I've said so far should back this up. The devs are taking more ownership. The tools that the devs have to hand means the quality of code is better. So this big army of waterfall test teams that we've had in the past, I think they are a thing of the past. I, we're not going to disappear. We're just going to become smaller in numbers. So think about, do you want to be in that picture on the right or not? And it's all about self-development and adding value. And one of the ways we can add value, I think we've all heard of the shift left, but shift right is actually as a team, and, and that team on the left, testers are in, um, the, the team that creates code. But I also think testers add great value by putting software to into the hands of customers that could be internal customers or limited, trusted external customers. We're really good at liaising with people. I think it's a really natural skill we have as testers. So sometimes the Agile team can only get to a certain amount of internal quality, and you have to then go and put it in the hands of the customers. And I think this is where we sit nicely in the Agile team, creating that internal quality. But then when we need to go to external to just get those bugs that we simply can't find in an Agile team, that's a role we can play. Don't be afraid of it. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room very quickly, the role of the test manager going forward. Um, I think it's changing and morphing. I think those things on the left are all going to be uh, attributes that um, the test manager of the future will need. Uh, and I'm not really going to go on that much more, to be honest, because I think I'm running out of time. Um, so 2025, again, this might make you feel pretty uncomfortable, but Facebook are doing this right now. They've put a little bot in that fixes code. Now, the thing with AI and machine learning is it doesn't just appear. It has to be built and tested. So all we're doing is building and testing a bit of software that does testing, okay, or checking. Um, so don't be afraid of this. Embrace it and start working closer with your data scientists, your data analysts, your engineers, to make sure that when they build bots like this, you're in it and you're adding value. And then lastly, it wouldn't be right of me to talk about the future without going to the year 2038. I started the journey with Y2K and I'm going to end it with 20, uh, 2038, Y2K 38. And you may be asking, what the hell is this? So if you use a 32-bit clock in your software, this is going to destroy your software in January 2030. I think it's the 19th of January. And I think it's about quarter past three in the morning. The reason being, the clock runs out of digits. You know, the binary clock for 32-bit in 2038 runs out, and it will reset itself to uh, 1901. This isn't a Y2K scaremongering thing. This is fact. And if you wonder why this is important now, think of hospitals. They don't change their software very often. Think about financial companies. I retire in 2039. 
if I ask a financial company to do a projection as to what I'm going to retire with, they're going to hit this bug if they're on a 32-bit internal clock. The fix is to upgrade to 64-bit, by the way. I just wanted to leave you with the extreme future and what we can start thinking about. And that, ladies and gentlemen, has done the talk. Thank, thank you very much, Lee. Um, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. Lots of food for thought there. I've been some questions myself, to be fair. So I'm going to take you, um, I'm going to go through some of the questions that come through now. Just bear one moment while I scroll through the tiny chat window. Um, first question comes from Lorraine. Um, she says, as the mainframe still exists, and I remember it well, has your testing approach changed since the 90s? And has how, my testing approach? And how has it changed since the 90s, yeah? I think it, it's a lot more collaborative. It's a lot more looking at the stack, which I learned at Sony Ericsson. So it's not just looking at you know, the end screen or the end thing that the user uses. It's, it's going right the way back. My approach is to get involved right at the very beginning, which sometimes happened in some of the waterfall teams I was part of, but it was very far and few between. Um, so every company I've been at, even at PlayStation, and I think Paul French is on the call, we used to go out to the dev studios and get really involved with them early on to say, how are you building in testability? And I think that's the thing that's probably changed more than anything, building in that testability, asking devs, how can we test that when it comes to us? Okay. Brilliant, thank you. Um, next question calls from John Feezy. He says, how did you see the testers in 2012 years combat the master of all things requirements? I suppose the answer is I didn't um, because I said that tester doesn't exist. There was a lot of imposter syndrome going on. And when I said 2012, I think that's when I first came across it, but it's been happening ever since. That hasn't stopped testers that go from this different world into agile, go through those slides that I mentioned. And I think it's about coaching the testers, but also going in and coaching the actual agile teams to make them realize that actually what you're looking for is a tester that doesn't exist. This tester that can do everything that I put on those two slides that can do those roles and do those tasks. I've never met a tester in my life that can do all those. And if anybody on the line thinks they can, I'd love to have a chat with you afterwards. Um, so I think it's a case of building on strengths, but getting the tester to be the, the, the estimate, the, the, the champion of testing in the Agile team, that means you don't have to be able to do all the testing. It means that you're just the champion because guess what? Outside of the Agile teams, there will be people, friends of the Agile teams that do have those specialisms. So if performance testing is a thing in the team that they need to conquer, then guess what? There's probably a performance test team in the organization that wants to give the team those skills. So that's how we, we did it at the very week. With the very group, we asked the uh, the performance teams to actually be the champions, but actually go in and 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 bring the teams up to skill with performance testing within the teams. It's an ongoing thing, by the way. What what do you think is going to be the main drive behind that, and how do you think it's going to change the marketing? It's going to be more people becoming almost like doing more and more more responsibilities and having different job titles. For example, I've seen job titles prior to the pandemic where people are looking for DevOps engineers and tests, which I've never seen before. So. How do you think that's sort of going to change and why? When you said dev, dev engineers in test, then did you hear yeah. that noise? That was another angel falling from heaven yeah. and, <laughs> and having a face splattered many, on the pavement. Yeah. I was like, right, okay. Yeah, so it, it's a tough one. I think the reason less testers are going to be needed is 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 multi layered. I think, as I said, the, the tool. I think engineers are really stepping up to the mark, and I think the platforms that we're building software in now has so many tools interweaven into them to make sure that the code that they're creating is of higher quality. That's one reason. The other reason is I think now the world and the public understand software a lot better. You think of lockdown. My wife couldn't use any kind of conferencing tool before lockdown. She can master it now. And I think this gap between people that are in tech and the public, I think, has got smaller. And I think now what that will breed, I think the public understand what a software bug is a lot better than, say, in 2002. And I think now the world will realize that it's all right to put software in the hands of users and get them to feedback because they are live. They are in the marketplace. They are out in the wild. So I think that's one of the reasons we'll, we'll see less testers coupled with the extra ownership and, and engineers stepping up to say, actually, I own the quality of this code because I wrote it. So I'm, I think it's a combination of the two coming together, but there's still loads and loads of value we can add. I think testers are the glue. 
you know, it's not always yeah. just testing. It's the glue of holding the team together. It's usually the tester that steps up for the scrum master, the BA or the tester. But I think, you know, pairing with devs, pairing with the business is going to be where the value is. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, got another question from um, a question from Catherine. How much emphasis do you put on the tester's skill at understanding requirements when hiring? Over the years, I've found that a lot of bugs are down to understanding requirements or poorly worded requirements. Yeah, I think it's a key skill because um, if you think, okay, so the, the, again, this is multi-layered. If we think back to, you know, we, we, we trust the requirements. Uh, back in the waterfall days, you've got requirements and it was gospel. It was like, that's the way it's meant to work. And actually through testing, we know actually the requirements can be wrong. And I think, again, it comes back to this basic skill of question asking. Now, QA, you could say stands for question asker. Now, I've stolen that from Duncan Nisbet. That's not my saying at all. But that ability to ask the question in an interview, I'm not just at looking for the skill of can they ask the question for the requirements. It's can they ask the question when they're pairing with devs? Can they ask the question when they're pairing with the business? Can they ask the question of the agile team? Can they ask the question, why are we actually doing this in the first place? Which I think is a key question that's always missed with every agile team that pick up a feature. They just pick it up and say, and just take it for granted that this is going to add value. The key question is why, why are we doing this? And yes, I do look for it in an interview. Fantastic. Thank you. Very useful advice. Um, question here from Ian. What is the right role now for someone who's gone through those years of experience, has seen the changes, and now has to persuade the recruiters um, that what they need is not yet another tester, but a mentor and bring it together of teams from left side to right side? Wow. I don't think that's to influence the recruiter. It's yeah, influencing, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, we've got to influence the people. We don't have control, unfortunately, and it's definitely no. the client that makes those decisions. No, I, I think it, in the old days when I said like the, the uh, recruiters were inserting ISTQB, I think those were in the naughty days of recruitment. I think those days are long gone. I sense the recruitment agency um, uh, community at the moment are very, very strong, actually, and my trust in the recruitment agency and the recruitment community is very strong. Uh, based off my experience in the last four years, but also from recruiting at the very group. But to get to the question, it's up to testers in current roles to influence uh, and say the value that coaching brings, quality coaching. There's a great person that somebody needs to follow. There's a couple of great people you need to follow. Uh, Ash Winter on Twitter and Rob Meany on Twitter. They've done a great book on um, testability and coaching. Uh, and I think that is something you should read along with that. That's a great read around becoming that coach, becoming that quality coach. I think this was given to me by Simon Long as a freebie. It's a great read. I strongly recommend that book. Cool. Um, one second. Um, in your opinion, would you hire someone with more manual testing experience, exploratory testing, uh, or, or, and less automation? What would be your sort of ideal hires? So every time I interview someone, I pull something out differently that is their strength. So I never go into a room saying, I'm going to look for somebody with 70% exploratory and 30% automation. I want to get to know the person, but more importantly, what's the, what's the gap we're trying to fill? Because each agile team will have a different gap because the quality mindset in each agile team will be different. So at Very, we'd go to the agile team and think, well, what's the gap we're trying to fill here? Uh, and then go and try and find a test that filled that gap. So it's very, very context-driven, and it's very, very driven by what each team is looking for. There's no generic answer there. Sorry. Okay. Um, so this is another question from me. Um, you're spot on what you say of the future. More and more of the last sort of two years, I've started to see on um, job specification requirements, people asking for Azure, AWS, et cetera, exposure to the cloud, more and more apparent. For those people in the industry at the moment that have never sort of touched upon that, don't have any experience that, how would you recommend they go about getting into that? Because I think you've identified the future trends spot on. So there's a lot of people going to think, okay, great, I'm going to take advice on board. How would you recommend they get into it? Okay, so there's, there's things that you can do for free uh, that don't cost any money. And then there's things you can do that cost a little bit of money. So I would go to the AWS Practitioner um, course which is about 18 hours long it's in aws it's very easy to find if you want to anthony i can send you a link to it afterwards that you can yeah. share with the, the community on this call and that is free until the exam at the end but guess what you don't have to take the exam but it is 150 pounds and i would strongly recommend it because once you take that exam and you pass aws give you discounts on all further courses and uh, 
that slide where I put up the AWS certifications was actually a list of all the courses they do. Um, and they're all very diverse. So go and have a look at that slide when you get the, the chance. Um, so that's free, but it takes a lot of time. And there's a lot of pausing it and going into AWS and actually doing. So number one, get yourself a free AWS account. Go and look at that course, but also go and look at Test Automation University. It's free. And the amount of courses on there that you could use to upskill, uh, those courses are created by um, you know, the, the go-to people in the community. They're not charlatans. They're not people that go and present and do jazz hands and then come off stage and don't have a clue what they're doing. These are highly respected people that are doing and they've created fantastic courses for absolutely newbies like me. So I've gone and done my Python course on there and it was fantastic. It was right at the correct level for someone like me new to Python. Um, there's loads of courses on there. Go and look at Test Automation University. Do it now. End this call. Do it now. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of people saying thank you for those recommendations. Really appreciate it. Um, a question from John. If you were able to build your own team, how many people would you have? And what are the skills which you feel don't work well together? It's a tricky one. Well, that's, that's again, very much driven by the size of the company, what you're trying to achieve. Um, that, that is almost an impossible question to answer however i will say that the best team i ever built i use something called the belbin model which um you can put people through it's almost like a a, a character um assessment and it, it shows you what kind of people fit which character in a team and once you fill all the characters you then should have the, the perfect team okay so no one has such thing as the perfect team but my highest performing team i ever created was through the Belbin model. Uh, and when I was given a, a blank canvas to create a team, that's what I used. And the results were phenomenal. That's it. Um, so basically, mate, we'll wrap it up now. We've had loads and loads of thanks. I'll, I'll send you a copy of the chat log. Um, a couple of people asked if any of the slides will be available after the talk so they could review some of the bullet recommendations you've made. Yeah, so what I'll do, Anthony, is um, the tool I've used is Prezi, which is a, a web Zooming presentation tool. I'll send you a link to the actual presentation, and awesome. you can send it out, and then people can click through it at their own leisure. Amazing. That would be really, really appreciated. Okay, guys, thank you so much um, um, for everyone that's attended today, mate. It's a great session. Thank you so much that tool, Leah. Really, really appreciated. Loads of interesting stuff there. <laughs> Definitely some things I've, I've taken away from it. I've been scribbling some notes down, so, yeah, absolutely fantastic. Um, keep an eye on the website, guys. We'll be posting details of upcoming events in the future. And that, thank you very much for everyone who's attended again. Stay safe, stay sane, and speak to you all soon. Take care now. Bye-bye.